Dr. Kim is a true leader, a young man today to be at the forefront of uh, technology while being a senior, senior teacher who's mentored a whole generation of retina surgeons and um, a lot of young ophthalmologists. Privileged to hear him on this subject. Thank you, sir, for that kind introduction. I think uh, <clears throat> the very fact that they put AI here in the leadership development uh, program shows the importance of AI. I'm sure every one of us are aware where it is coming from. I do not have any financial disclosures. Sir, uh, just a minute, sorry to interrupt. I'd love to also invite Dr. Gopal Arora, sir. He's the other co chair for this. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, sir. We are really in the midst of a transformation. I'm sure all of us are aware, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, genomics, all of these, some things we never heard of about 10 years back is, is playing a bigger role in how we will be practicing our uh, speciality. And it's really coming fast. It is a surprise not just for the clinicians, but even for the, uh, the uh, computer scientists who are on this field, the way it is rapidly growing everywhere over a, in a very short period of time, you've seen so many new algorithms which are coming in and what impact it is making in many aspects, not just medicine, but in every aspect of our life, it is there. Would you believe that there are already 700 FDA approved AI based medical devices? You can imagine what there may be in the other fields, but just in medicine, you have more than 700 already approved uh, just in the last two years, because the first one, the IDX, which was for the diabetic retinopathy, came in about uh, 2016 or 17. And uh, subsequent to that, we have been hearing so many other devices. And uh, medical imaging has emerged as one of the strong focus areas uh, of artificial intelligence. There's a huge corporate list as I mentioned, there are more than 700 devices. GE has about 52, Siemens 36, Canon 22, and, and so on. So there are so many already there in the market, which is being used, I mean, which is using AI in their devices. So what is AI in our practice? It is clinical workflow, mostly, and there are a lot of applications that are happening in the non-clinical workflows. But what I'll be showing, or sharing with you our experience on the clinical workflow and how it is impacting. In, uh, as I said, in the clinical practice, we do use it in the, in the, in the clinical side, like in ima using the imaging and using our clinical data, but people are using it, the automation for administrative than for direct uh, patient care activities. What can AI do? AI. Today, everybody is talking about diabetic retinopathy uh, screening, which is the low-hanging fruit where every Tom, Dick, and Harry, meaning the engineering students, started working on trying to develop an algorithm for this uh, AI, uh, I mean, DR screening, and it's happening. You have any number of DR screening algorithms today that are available, uh, and many of them working very well. I'm sorry. So AI can help in screening a disease and helping in making a diagnosis in some places in the management, let's see. We've been doing this telescreening for almost 20 years now where we, we the, trained the diabetologist clinic uh, technician to take photos, send it to the reading center where our retina specialist would read these images, generate a report and send it back. But we realized there were challenges, it's a lot of time wasted for the retina specialist time and having trained people to do the grading is important, is very difficult. The delay in grading over two to three hours, inconsistency in grading is a, is a big uh, challenge in this process. So we worked with uh, Shankar Rajiv Raman and myself had worked with the Google team to work on this, developing an algorithm. And today we have this algorithm, uh, which, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, it's supposed to be a video, which is, anyway, it's just simple uh, thing is to, as soon as you take the picture, the algorithm will do the grading and it'll, within a minute it shows you 
what type of grading of diabetic retinopathy that is there. So we did the validation tests both at uh, Shankaranetralia and at Arvind, and we have seen that it is much better than, or even better than a retina specialist, because one, it gives a very consistent grading, and it is able to pick up even those smaller microaneurysms which our human eyes do not see. We've been, since 2019, since it got CE certified, we've been using it in real time, and today, in fact, it's more than 700,000 eyes that have been screened for diabetic retinopathy uh, across various centers at our web. So what is important to see is, I was just looking at uh, the data of the screening, the same number of patients that we were earlier looking at using the manual grading. We had picked up about 1,090 patients for the one year period. Then I looked at the data in 2022. The number had gone to almost eight times it had gone up it's a huge, huge increase in the detection rate, either we were missing those, which means we were, this was able to pick up much faster, much better. Uh, of course, we do a lot of, uh, you know, back-end sampling and testing it human grading because our human mind doesn't usually accept uh, easily whether the machine can do better than us. But um, it, surprisingly, it was doing better, and uh, we, this is the, uh, number that has come up after this process. But we still have a long way to go in diabetes detection, imaging, and scaling. And now there are a lot of work going on in glaucoma, where a lot of people are working on uh, finding glaucoma, or diagnosing glaucoma, or screening glaucoma, I won't say glauc diagnosing, and in the community, and then also for age-related macular degeneration. But what's also happening is to find if Diabetic macular edema can be detected just using a fundus photo. So the work is in progress in this. Whether AI can measure the OCT thickness, you don't need to do those reading, keep waiting and doing all that. Soon that will happen. It is, it's already there. But these are things that our human eyes can do. But what is it that human eyes cannot do and AI is able to do is something phenomenal, I'm sure. Every one of you have heard all these things. Predicting the risk of developing diabetic retinopathy in a patient who has not yet developed diabetic retinopathy, a diabetic patient, what are the chances he will develop diabetic retinopathy in the next five years? Now, this will be possible. Of course, this is, these are all work in progress because it still needs a lot of data to ensure that this is get validated, but we know that it's going to be there. Predicting conversion to wet uh, age-related macular degeneration. Again, patient presenting to you with drusens, what are the chances? Predicting refractive error from fundus images. You know, not by retinoscopy, but can a fundus, just taking a fundus image, can we say what is the refractive error? We have all heard this even five years back that, you know, just from the fundus photos, we can Find out by 97% accuracy the gender of the patient, 67% accuracy the age of the patient, and uh, a lot of interest has come in these cardiovascular risk factors just using fundus photos. And still there is a lot of work happening because this needs a lot of longitudinal data to validate this kind of uh, claim, whether just a retinal image can give you this information, cognitive impairment from the retinal scans. We are working on this by just taking an external eye photo, just with using your uh, mobile phone or any simple phone, you take a photo of the external eye and it is able to give a lot of systemic markers such as uh, you know, the kidney function, your hemoglobin level, your HbA1c level. All these are, you are able to predict by just taking a photograph of the eye. How it does, it's still the explainability is there, but this again is a work in progress. We are, we are working with some teams to do this, uh, to see if it will be possible. Can we do away without the blood test? But as I was looking at it, I heard in recent one of the meetings that I attended, this, one of my friends showed me this tagline, take a selfie and know you are healthy. This is already out there in Canada. This is algorithm has come and it is waiting for approval from the FDA, where you just take a picture of the, your face, and it is able to give various parameters that is mentioned here, that is blood pressure, cardiac workload, heart rate, you mention it, it is there. 
you don't know it is working, but looks like they're already in the market means they must have done a lot of validation tests and they've even submitted it for FDA. So what I'm trying to show is that these are things that are going to come in future for us to play with. Use of retinal images to uh, detect uh, AI is going to be the way. Home monitoring tools using AI will be the way to going forward, so I will I'll skip all this. What is also happening is there's a lot of interest in uh, combining imaging and data. And this is going to be what we call as oculomics. There are uh, many algorithms that are out there. We have heard of ChatGBT. This is what is called as MedPalm 2 by Google, where you will be, this is specifically for medical field, where you will be able to summarize your previous patient's data for, to see it in one glance to make decisions. And it will even give you suggestions based on the previous history of the patient or the management skills, the, the way you have trained your management uh, ways can, these algorithms can show you the way for every patient that you're treating uh, based on just its learning from your own background. So there's quite a few things that are happening. We'll soon see this change in the next few years. Physicians, of course, many of them see as an advantage using an AI. So AI is an enabler and it will soon be in many aspects of medicine. So we have to acknowledge the interdisciplinary uh, evolution of healthcare. We need to participate and be optimistic and uh, you know, work our way around this. So basically AI is there, so we need to partner with the AI to ensure that we move forward because that's the way it is going to be there in every aspect of our practice. Thank you, sir. Dr. Manish would like to say Excellent presentation, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure listening to you. I had two questions, sir. What, what was the reason for eight times the difference between the human per sitting there and reading, like we were doing address system at that time, and the artificial this thing? And could it be because uh, how do you look into the confounding agents, sir? Like hypertensive retinopathy uh, also has bleed. Was it machine is it differentiate between diabetic bleed and hypertensive bleed? So what has been happening is the eight times challenge is mainly because I said it is able to like I've seen those pictures. I would have said there's no AI. Then you zoom out those pictures, you would pick up those small microaneurysms in those diabetic patients. So the mild NPDR that we missed seems to be there. But is the eight times all mild NPDR? No. There are some cases which we have missed somewhere. So I have not screened all those images, but just the data was a little surprising for me. So the hypertensive retinopathy or vein occlusions, yes, it does say that it is there, but it doesn't point it out as a uh, diabetic retinopathy. It doesn't grade it as diabetic retinopathy, but definitely there are says there is an abnormality that is there and it says refer. So anything that is mild, I mean moderate and above, it becomes a referable condition. And anything that is ungradable becomes a referable condition for, for the patient. So that's the way it has been designed. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I think uh, it's not just about eye reading, it's now about face reading. So we'll be very scared to send our photographs to Dr. Kim. <laughs> but the jokes apart, I think it's going to revolutionize medicine just as it is going to revolutionize all other aspects of our life. Yes. Sir, uh, so currently is it, it's looked at as a screening tool as, as such, as in it, you know, our life now depend, depend on it. Pardon, Current, sir? Currently the AI is looked at as a screening tool to make our life easier, but our lives don't depend on it. No. But then, but then do you see AI going to a stage where it's going to become like diagnostically a, as important as it is, yes, it, it, is it is likely to become a diagnostic tool at some point of time. Uh, timeline, I would say even next one year's time or even six months down the line, because there's a lot of work that's happening in that field, and it's really making a difference. So, yeah. No, no escape now, it is here. Not tomorrow. So we'll thank uh, Dr. Thank you so Kim much.